Welcome everyone. <clears throat> I'm Brian Jones, professor of sociology, and I've tormented many of you in class, so you recognize the display behind me. Uh, that is my model of social capital in America. But much more important and of immediate relevance to us is this is your life. This is my life. This is everybody's life I know. The four zones are all terms that you recognize. Family, work, which looms immediately before those of you who actually will graduate. Voluntary association, group membership, and of course social networks, all the names that populate your cell phones. I maintain that we spend 90% of our waking time in these zones. And even though you recognize the terms, these are living social structures. We spend our time building and maintaining social structures in these areas. And you may have discerned cool little lines connecting them. There are linkages between them. These are not separate compartments of life. Uh, and they're real. So this little connection here between work and family was very important to me at exactly your age. I couldn't decide whether to become a lawyer and have my soul be forever lost, or become a professor in sociology. It soon became clear that if I chose the former and became a lawyer, that would probably be it for the marriage. So the real linkage there for me is it set my career course. Again, a personal indication. This connection here between social networks and work. Over 30 years ago, I got a call on a Friday afternoon from a friend I only saw a few times a year, a week tie. And he said, if you want that cool Villanova job, you better get on the trolley right now. I wasn't driving at the time. If I didn't do that, this didn't happen. There are interesting trends in these boxes, too. This one. Americans are spending less time neighboring every year. Americans are spending more time friending every year. These are trends not just on the board, not just in some data bank in your lives. In all the trends, though, the most powerful one, I'll call it a mega trend, is happening right here. We in America work more hours than anybody for whom we have data. And it's getting much worse. So work hours in America over the past 40 years have increased significantly for men and women, for young and old, and more to the immediate point, the fastest acceleration in work hours in my entire data bank is among college graduates. So, by my calculations, five of you, when I see you again at your first reunion, will be working 60 to 80 hours. And the trend lines look like this. Given the importance work is going to loom in your immediate future life, I give you strong advice about the presentation about to occur. Listen carefully. Thank you. Bernie? Thanks, Bernie. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bernie Gallagher. I'm also a professor of sociology. And I'm uh, slightly better dressed because, in all honesty, I, I rented this suit. <laughs> On a serious note, it's an honor to be here today in a room with people of such ilk. And I mean the students. And I also mean my esteemed colleagues from my department, including our chairperson, Dr. Dufina and my buddy, Dr. Jones. And most importantly, our graduates who have come back to speak to us today about their careers. I'll introduce them in a moment. Funny thing happened to me last week. One of my students came up to me and said uh, that his dad was a sociology major here a number of years ago, and that uh, he should ask me about some of our graduates, because some of them be have become famous. I said, oh, yeah, that's true. 
we tend to produce the best of the class. Can you give me some examples? I said, well, the first three that come to mind uh, include Jim Croce, who was an internationally known rock musician. I'm sure you've heard of him. He passed too early. More recently, Netta Lynch, a Rhodes Scholar. That's pretty cool. And even more recently, Carolyn Vreeland, now known as Carolyn Everson, who you'll see on television from time to time, who is now Vice President of International Relations of Facebook. I said, I think your dad was right. Yeah, looks that way. I want to change my major. What should I do? I said, what year are you in? He said, I'm a senior. And I said, believe me, your Nova degree will be good enough, so don't worry about everything. It'll all work out. So we have a lot of class acts that have graduated from this university. And today, I really want to emphasize the fact that a lot of them were sociology majors. Here's the living proof. Our guest speakers today include a dear friend of mine, Chris Brennan, now known as Chris Curtis. Sorry, people get married and have children. <laughs> She's on a vice presidential level with a major financial institution. Joe Crowart, buddy of Brian's, who is now in a combined law MBA program at Johns Hopkins University. Did I get that correct? And University of Maryland School of Law. And University of Maryland School of Law. And my buddy Vince Garzarella, who has a high level position with Vanguard. So what we'd like to do is to have each of these people talk for 10 or 15 minutes about their experiences from NOVA to today, career-wise, and then we'll open it up for questions. And they'll have answers because they're real smart. As far as the questions go, feel free to ask them anything uh, in terms of the everyday hassles of their occupational experiences to tips about job interviews, anything goes. And also, since I'm looking at Mariana, I just remembered that I'm supposed to make two announcements, which I will screw up. One is, this is being taped because it's going to be on our departmental webpage, and you'll get notification as to the date when that is available. You will run to your computer and watch it immediately. No, seriously, we'll let you know somehow, probably by email. And what's the other thing? You want people to like us. Please like us. <laughs> We're on Facebook. We want to be liked by more, more, more and more people. So who wants to who wants to go first? Well, I was going to introduce you as our finest speaker and tallest, and then I was going to introduce him as our finest speaker and funniest, and then I was going to introduce her as our finest speaker and best looking. But I forgot that joke, so I sort of forced it in. <laughs> Go ahead, you guys first. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. I'm I'm uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've been doing the past 20 years since graduating from Villanova, but I don't want to make this all about me. I'm going to try and put some lessons in because really it's, it's what you guys take away from today that's important. So, first question, um, does anybody know anybody who goes to University of Virginia or familiar with UVA? Yes. Do you, do you uh, know what they call a freshman at UVA? Anybody? They call them a first year student. Anybody figure out why? Thomas Jefferson founded the University of Virginia, and his belief was that learning was a lifelong thing. So there is no freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. There's first year, second year, third year, fourth year. Well, Thomas Jefferson would have gotten a kick out of me because I've been in school a real long time now. <laughs> um, I, I, when I was here at Villanova, I began majoring <coughs> in, in history. And at the time, history was my passion. <coughs> The department was older, and I wasn't getting a lot out of it. Then I, I met a couple of these fellows from the sociology department, and they were younger, dynamic, and I really took Whoa, it. And, and 20 years later, they're still dynamic. 
<laughs> stepped on your joke, sorry. But um, uh, professors like Brian, uh, Rick, Prickley, Rick Eckstein, another one, Satya Patnayak. Um, in them, I found some real, real excitement, energy. They were great mentors, and I really took to it. So I decided I was going to be a sociology professor. Graduated here in December 1993. Went off to University of Maryland, College Park, and began a PhD program. Got a master's a couple of years later. I was focused in organizations. Uh, went on beyond that. And as I, as I got closer to, to the PhD, started thinking about it, started thinking about my life. I was, I was envisioning having to move across the country somewhere to teach. And I loved the teaching. I, I really enjoyed the research. But I decided I wanted to do something different. My family has a business in Ocean City, Maryland. And I decided to it's really cool to live at the beach, so I moved down there. And for years, I, I worked in the family business. And it was, it was fun, it was lucrative, it was great. Then about 10 years ago, I started <coughs> noticing certain changes. When you're trained in sociology, and you spend your days with a cash register in front of you, and you're banging buttons, if you stop to pay attention to people, you can start seeing trends at the micro level. So many people miss out on that, but if you just people watch, you can pick up on that. Well, I can tell you that you all consume fundamentally differently than your parents did at the same age. As the generations have changed, patterns of retail consumption are, are totally different. I started noticing people walking down the boardwalks down the boardwalk, and they weren't carrying the bags that they used to be carrying. Why? Because it used to be that when you went on vacation, you went somewhere, and shopping was one of the things you were going to be doing while you were there. Well, as you know, you can sit in your boxer shorts at night on a Friday night, well, not on a Friday night, but on a Wednesday <laughs> night, and, and in your dorm or whatever, and order pretty much anything you need online. So, Patterns of consumption started to change. Well, I thought about what this meant for our family business. I thought, well, you know, long term, it's not like things are going to revert back to what they used to be. So I started thinking about, and I'm, I'm married, I have two young children, about their ages. Um, and I and started thinking long term. And I also had an itch to do something. So at age 39, I told my wife I was going to go back to school, and she said, what? And I said, no, I've decided I'm going back to school, and I think I'm going to go to law school. And she said, how long is that going to take? I said, three years. And she said, three years? And I heard the same thing from, from many other people. Three years? Well, my attitude was that three years was going to be coming either way. At the end of it, I'd be better off if I had a law degree than if I didn't. So much to my wife's chagrin, I applied to law school, went to the University of Maryland, I, I had considered business school at the time. I figured that law school would provide me more opportunity. I was jumping back into, I wanted to jump back into the job force. I had a lot of experience working in a family-owned retail business. It wasn't necessarily something that was quantifiable in the job market. So I figured giving myself a law degree. I didn't do it necessarily to be a lawyer, but to create opportunity. So I went back to school in fall of 2010. And the legal job market was coming back up. And then it totally collapsed again. And I started looking around, thinking, okay, I made this gamble. I borrowed all this money. I have a wife and two children. My wife's going to leave me if I graduate from this program without the job. She wasn't really going to leave me. <laughs> she, was I hope she was thinking about it. <laughs> so uh, I started thinking, okay, what makes me fundamentally different from my classmates. <coughs> what gives me the edge, aside from these little gray hairs that I have up here. And I realized, well, I have this business background. And lesson number one for you guys, think about what makes you different from your classmates. You're entering job markets. Are you guys all seniors or mixed or 
You can see the fear in their eyes, can't you? <laughs> uh, that's that glazed over dead tuna look that you used to talk about. I did. Um, where was I? Um, job market. Figure out what makes you different. When you're in a job interview, you're going to be asked what makes you different because they're going to have all sorts of qualified people applying for those jobs. Figure out <coughs> what makes you different. What made me different was that business background. So I started looking into JD MBA programs. Johns Hopkins had started a program a few years ago. It was right there in Baltimore. It fit together. Um, so I've been at business school this year. Next year I will graduate with both degrees and I'll go to the business side of things. So the takeaways from my whole, oh, wait a minute. I want to talk a little bit about sociology. The dry erase pen here. This year I've been taking a course. Thank you. Here I've been taking a course in uh, um, uh, networked organizations. Now, when I was here 20 years ago, Rick Einstein was the first person who started teaching me about organizations. This guy here, he started teaching me about networks. Have you worked Facebook and LinkedIn into your lectures yet? Yeah, but that's not for us baby members. That's what you've been doing. I've been telling him for years to talk about Facebook, that it would grab your attention. Well, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I'm not going to do this. But, uh, who here has heard of a fellow named Mark Granovetter? Anybody? You, sir. <laughs> Who is Mark Granovetter? Uh, Mark Granovetter is a brilliant social network theorist. Uh, he wrote a book called The Strength of Weak Ties. Social relationships that don't seem that important in your life, but they are. Okay. The person there in the center is me. These are my network ties. Mark Granovetter was doing his PhD at Harvard in 1973, and he was, he was looking at how people got jobs. And his belief, and, and the belief of many, was that people were get landing jobs through their strong network ties. Much to his surprise, and to the surprise of many others too, he found that that was not the case. It was not the strong tie, but the weak ties that were beyond it. Now, this year I started applying for internships. I thought to myself, okay, I'm Joey Crowart, and you know, I'm looking at myself compared to my, my classmates. I've got the JD that they don't have. I have six publications at the bottom of my resume. They didn't have those. I thought that this was going to be easy for me. And through much of the winter, I did not get a single call for an interview. What's going on here? So I was like, okay, well, I can fall back on my network. So I reached out to my friend Scott here, and I reached out to a guy over at the Attorney General's office, and I said to those guys, well, hey, you know, you have any, you know of any job openings? And they said, well, no, I don't. I was like, okay. So then I reached out to a guy at Exelon, and I reached out to a guy at Johns Hopkins, and I said, yeah, and these are good friends of mine. I said, well, do you have any openings? I figured somebody would have some. Nobody had it. So a couple weeks ago, we were uh, in my, my organization's class. We started talking about Mark Ranavetter again, some, a name I hadn't heard for 15 years. And I said, oh, yeah, strong ties and weak ties. And this changed my whole approach. So now I, I went back to Scott, and I said, Scott, you know, you don't have anything. Do you know of somebody else who I might be able to talk to? I'm interested interested in doing this and this and this. Maybe I could just talk to them. And he said, yeah, sure. I know just the guy for you to talk to. So he's setting me up with this guy. I, I, I called another guy from our, our, our retail business. And I said, do you know anything about this? Do you know anybody in business law? And he said, oh, yeah, my college roommate. He's a business law attorney at a big firm in Baltimore. Let me, let me introduce you to him. So I've had some exchanges with him. And the key is, when you talk to this person, well, there's a couple of keys. First, you never, ever, ever ask somebody for a job. Bad move. 
don't ask somebody for a job because you will turn them off immediately. Instead, and this is one of the best pieces of advice I ever got, try to get them interested in you. If they, have, if they take a vested interest in you, then they will want to see you succeed. Second piece of advice, when you talk to this person, when you get to the end of the conversation and it's clear to you that that person does not have anything that they more that they can offer you, maybe job-wise, you say, anybody else you can think of, another person or two? Because maybe there's somebody out there. Maybe there's somebody out there and you don't know unless you ask. If you don't ask that question, that's a dead end. It all stops right there. So, takeaways. Um, first of all, be ready to adapt in your life to changing conditions. Pay attention to what's going on. Think of some of the businesses that have failed over the years. Borders Books, for instance. Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, Wikipedia knocked them out within a couple of years. It was nothing that these companies were doing internally. They were focused internally, and everything was fine. But the environment around them was changing. It's very important to keep paying attention to what's going on around you. I had no designs on going back to school at age 39. And I can tell you my wife didn't have any designs on me going back to school at 39 either. But it was the right thing to do at the time. The adapting to things that were changing. Second, work these networks. You can't network enough. But remember the strong ties, weak ties finding of Mark better. It is not the strong ties that are, are more likely to get you where you want to be. It's the weak ties. So, questions? Anything at all? I think we're going to do them all at the oh, end. If you've had a, uh, an overview of all three, and like I said, you know, make this as interactive as possible. You don't have to clean the board. I'll, I'll do that. You like the sound? Yes. <laughs> Very accurate. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. I forgot to make an announcement. You're all part of an important day. Uh, this is the 25th anniversary of the annual career event for sociology majors. So that guy got a good looking group. Thanks, Vin. <coughs> There's a prize under each of your seats. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. This is, uh, this is pretty cool with the camera. I don't feel like it's a tech talk. Like, should I have an earpiece or something talking about innovation? But um, well, we're not going to talk about innovation. What we'll talk about is the innovation of my sociology degree to where I am today, and maybe get you thinking a little bit about the innovation of you and your degree and where you'll be in 15 years. You may be the one standing up here telling your story. So I'll give you a little bit of background in terms of my career journey and family life, and also I'll give you a little bit of insight as to how my sociology degree got me here today, standing in front of you telling you about it. So I am a senior manager at Vanguard, a large financial services firm um, right up the road. I've been there 15 years. Um, I oversee two organizations uh, with a total of, I think it's 49 people at this point that are uh, in my groups. Um, and I can tell you that when I was sitting in your seats, I had it all figured out. <coughs> I was going to graduate with a degree in sociology. I lived in the city of Philadelphia. My best friend's father was the assistant chief of probation. I wanted to be working probation and parole. It was a very politically charged environment. He was going to help me. He was helping me build networks. He was helping me make connections. I was ready to take the test. And I was commuting to Villanova. Went home after class one day. And my dad said, guess what? We're selling the house and we are moving out of the city into the suburbs, and you can come along with us if you'd like, or you can get your own place, stay in here, or wherever it may be. Because to work for the city of Philadelphia, you have to live in the city of Philadelphia. And I didn't have a job at that point, and I was just graduating, and I wasn't 100% sure if I was gonna have a job, so I wasn't sure if I'd be able to survive on my own. So I had to abandon plan A and say, well, can I stay with you for a little while while I get my feet under me? But in order to do that, I, I wouldn't be able to work for the city. I had to give up on that dream because I wasn't living in the city at that point. So 
I needed a job. So I came back to campus after I graduated in 97, and it was in Poland time. Is it still in Poland time? It's barely, it's it's still barely standing. Is Poland time still around? <laughs> it shouldn't be. Career Center is who? Career Center, well, Poland time was old then, too. So, so uh, through on campus recruiting, came back, had an interview on campus, uh, got this job in an entry level position in the business world. <coughs> And I went home and I told my parents, hey, this is great, I got a job, get myself up on my feet, I'm going to move out, get my own place. And my dad said, well, what are you going to be doing? And I said, um, not really sure, but I'm going to be working in the business world. And he laughed at me. And the reason why he laughed at me is because when I was here and I went home and said, I'm going to get a degree in sociology and I want to work in probation and parole, my parents said to me, why can't you just go to the business school and get a nice safe job? sitting behind a desk and interacting with people rather than interacting with people with criminal backgrounds and, and other issues. So I ate a little bit of crow in the fact that I ended up in the business world. Uh, I think the most important thing is the fact that I've been there 15 years, I started in an entry level position, and I've gradually over the years been working my way up in terms of different positions and different levels of responsibility to now I'm at the point where I manage a large organization I interact with a lot of senior level management and leadership in the company. Um, I've built extensive networks in the industry outside of the people that I interact with on a daily basis. And uh, sociology has really helped me get there in part. Um, just a little bit of background by way of family. So my wife has a career of her own. She is a senior manager for a large television retailer who you've probably seen on cable. They are local in Westchester. They begin with a Q and with a C. Um, they can spell it. Yeah. I'm not going to give you what the uh, third letter is. You're probably pulled together. Um, so she's got a career of her own that she's managing. And we have two young kids. We've got a five-year-old daughter and a soon-to-be two-year-old son who, I agree, if I brought him in here, that would be a social experiment in and of itself. These boards would probably come down. Um, and I'm also getting my MBA. I've got one year left, and I'm doing that at St. Chips. Um, <laughs> he just cursed under his breath. <laughs> so there's a lot of balls in the air at my house. There's a lot of balls in the air at my house um, because there are priorities with work and there are priorities with family and there are priorities with school. So, you know, there's a bunch of people that I work with who are going through the program as well. And the big joke last week was we're getting towards the end of the semester and we're all taking the summer off because we'll have four classes left, so we'll be done by next May. And everyone was saying how it's been a bit of a strain on themselves and a bit of a strain on their family because someone else has to pick up the pieces. And I was joking about the fact that I think last week my wife snuck out one night and went to a single parent um, uh, help group. Because <laughs> um, I think sometimes it feels that way for her. Um, but, but you know, we, we feed off of each other. And, and I step in and help her when she needs help, and she steps in and helps me. And that's part of the whole equation of what's going to happen to you in your careers and the futures that, that, that you can head out on. And don't be afraid of where life takes you, because I didn't think life would take me to where I am today. So I'm going to take a, a minute and talk a little bit about how my degree has helped me get to, to where I am. Um, you know, it's interesting. I tell a lot of people that if you go to school for pre-med or medical school or engineering or nursing or a few other disciplines, you are really going to school to learn a specific skill set and a specific trade. Anything outside of that, you're probably going to school to learn how to think. And that's what sociology has really done for me. You're here and your minds are being stretched and expanded. You probably don't even realize it. Um, social theory is still part of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming people are either taking or had taken social theory. So think about, think about the fact that it's withstand the test of time, right? You've got Marx, Comte, Durkheim, whoever. Who's your favorite sociologist? You can name whoever you like. The research and the theories that they've done have withstand the test of time. And you've been studying those, and from those, you've been learning. You've been learning how to, to cognitively think. You've been learning how to conceptually think. You may not understand that or may not realize that, but when you get out into the world, those are valuable skills that sociology has given you that you're going to be able to use to excel in your careers. I didn't know the first thing about business when I graduated. I stepped in my first MBA class and I didn't know anything about business. 
I can tell you, I took intro to accounting in my first class. Uh, I think it's the first business class I've taken in my life. That was after about 13 or 12, 12 or 13 years into my career. And I spent hours studying accounting just so I could be proficient in it to, to do well in the class. You would have thought all those years in the business world, I would have had an understanding of that. Well, I necessarily didn't because I didn't do it every day. But those are the kinds of things that when you, get a, when you get a job, you can be taught those things. But you can't teach someone how to think conceptually. You're, you're learning about that here and you're practicing that here. Um, you know, you, you can't teach people about organizations. I know a lot of smart people who make a lot of money for companies with things like derivatives and security exchange and overnight lending and trading, but they don't have accounts of people skills. Now, it's great the fact that they're able to make a lot of money for companies, but you need people who can work with people as well. Big part of my job is who have I taken along with me? So it's about inter, uh, interacting with people and being able to bring them along in terms of, of working with them and coaching them and advancing their careers. And sociology will help you with a lot of that. You probably understand a lot about organizational dynamics and a lot about people and you may not even know it. When you get into the working world and you get a job, you'll start to see that. If you, if you take a second, you pause and you reflect on what you've learned in, in, in your curriculum here, you'll start to see those things play out. You know, I, I, uh, I joke with my wife and it drives her nuts. I tell her all the time, yeah, I work in the business world, but I'm a sociologist by trade. And she just reminds me I have an undergrad in sociology, not a PhD. But uh, the more I've been out of school, the more I've spent looking and thinking about the things I've learned in terms of sociology. Because you read things in a chapter, but then you get out in the real world and you see them. And it's the fact that you're learning valuable skills in terms of culture and people and organizations. And that makes you very marketable. And that's something that employers are very, very much so interested in. So um, again, I would encourage you to not be afraid of where life is going to take you, because life has taken me to some place I didn't think it would. Um, it's given me and my family a very, very good life. And sociology has certain been, certainly been the launching pad to that. And I don't forget that. So um, thank you very much. Okay, now this is where you participate. We need, we need, we encourage questions. Something must be rattling through your heads. What would you like to ask any one of our panel members? You're being taped. Um, Make it smart. <laughs> someone also interested in going into a program where a JDM grants offer. Um, I like go to a lot of events and I always value the experience and knowledge and wisdom that all these people bring to me through their different you know, like road and path to where they got. Um, and I've been told that that is so valuable to also have when you go for a furthering degree. Um, but I have parents on me who are saying if you go <laughs> continue your college education right, like right after you graduate, you can defer student loans and be better off that way. And I was just wondering, how you feel taking, you know, going later on in life, what, do you wish you took a different path earlier on? Do you wish you found this, like, a right after you graduated from here? This is, this is a very good question because it's something that many people wonder when the timing is right to do. And there's a trade-off. Um, on one hand, if you go right out of undergrad, you lack the sort of life experience that can really give you an edge in graduate school classes. Earlier this year, um, in my MBA program, one of my, there's a broad age range within our MBA program, but one of the, the students who was a year or so out of undergrad asked the professor in class what an insurance deductible was. And half of us looked at each other like, how could you be in business school and not know what an insurance deductible was? But then I saw the other half of the class was like him. They didn't know. So there's something to be said for living a few years and getting some work experience and understanding what professionalism is before you to go to school. The flip side of that is, as you grow older, you will get busier. You might think right now, I don't have the time for more school. Well, guess what? 
you're going, you have more time now than you ever will have. The three of us are parents. We can tell you, it gets nuts. So, I, I, I hope that, you, you know, there's pros and cons to both. I would say it's good to have some work experience first, but if you can get the schooling done in your 20s, that will help you too. I agree with Joe. My, my personal feelings, and they're only my own feelings, uh, is that the best route is right from college into med school, grad school, law school, whatever it might be. I think that if I had fooled uh, around for a year or two, I might have lost my motivation. Plus, I like this is my own kind of OCD makeup. I like to get things over with so I can proceed with the rest of my life. I don't know whether I would have uh, been as successful as, as Joe is if I waited that long. I might have uh, gone in different directions. I might have ended up in a rock band and be dead by now. <laughs> so that's what, I, that's what I would suggest. Yeah. Sue, what about you, Brian? Do you have any feelings about that? Uh, I, I worked for a year <coughs> in an anti-poverty program in Philadelphia. And that year really helped sharpen my perspective. Basically, I ran kicking and screaming back in academia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and picked up maybe some professionalism along the way. I can tell you that the, the biggest challenge about, I was out of school over 10 years when I'd gone back, and the biggest challenge for me was the fact that I had to learn differently. Um, you know, do you use Blackboard here? Yeah. There was no Blackboard when we were here. Everything was on paper, syllabus were on paper. Everything was, was done differently. There weren't PCs in the uh, classrooms and there weren't smart boards. I entered into an environment that I wasn't familiar with. So in that first accounting class I took, it literally took me six weeks to understand and retrain myself on how I needed to learn because everything was so different. Yes. Um, as a graduating senior, I was wondering what your mind frame was when you were looking for a job. How long term were you looking? Or were you looking more for just finding the job for the next step? Or were you thinking about an investment? say that I absolutely had no idea what I wanted to do because again I had my whole path got kind of after I said I, I was going to go get a degree and then I'm not and I went into consulting which I knew nothing about I really kind of just said maybe I can just learn as much as I possibly can from here and then see where that takes me in the consulting world generally a lot of people don't stay with them long term it's kind of a launching point into something else so I knew it wasn't going to be forever, but I knew that that's kind of that time to kind of try and touch as many different industries and different types of roles that I could, so I could figure out maybe what I wanted to do. And I still didn't know what I wanted to do until, you know, I got further down the line. So, you know, that, that's just my experience. Yeah. I, I think um, one of the big things for me is making the decision of job versus career. And one of the drivers was when I was interviewing, I was spending a lot of time doing research on the actual companies I was interviewing with to realize if it was the right fit for, am I going to get a job where I can gain some experience and parlay that into something else in the longer term versus am I looking somewhere to park myself for quite some time and to make a career out of it? Yeah. Um, you guys have talked about how you work your way up within your different organizations. That's Katie, by the way. I know everybody's name. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just wondering how important you feel lateral moves are within the organization and getting to where you are now. I think it's super important. I mean, where I work, they actually have a whole work stream dedicated toward um, helping people move laterally within the company alone. In general, they try not to keep people in the same role. They say two years is too short. About seven or eight years is too long for you to be in the same role. So they actually facilitate the process of moving you laterally around all the time. To move up the chain is a much, at least where I am, it's a very long process and a lot of things have to happen in order for you to, to get those promotion levels. Granted, most people move laterally within their roles to help them gain more experience. And they figure that these people, we've already invested in them, we'd much rather keep our talent internally rather than try and hire externally if we can. 
So if somebody finds it, it's time for them to try something new, they're happy to help try and place you within another role uh, rather than trying to backfill that with somebody externally. That's been my experience. <coughs> I think, I think lateral movement is critical. Um, you know, it gives someone an opportunity to, to learn a little bit about the department or a role before advancing in that. I've had se several lateral moves that helped me get to where I am. And a good example is, um, you know, I spent time as a supervisor moving laterally before I was able to be promoted to a manager. And although I thought I might have been ready at that point to be a manager, I clearly wasn't. And being a supervisor and gaining that level of experience really helped me excel once I did get promoted. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> my question is, as like you guys were speaking, you had like great stories of saying that like sociology was like a good backbone and things like that, but were you ever undergrad that maybe discouraged or thinking that because you didn't end up in a path of maybe being a sociologist or so did you ever think you should have went down a different road? No, I didn't. Honestly, I really didn't. I think that that gave me the opportunity, and I think that would be just to think differently. And that, to me, is the biggest skill set, to be able to think in a larger term way. I see it every day in what I do, people interact with, whether it was from a more, you know, driven technical management side or more of a, you know, inter people interaction side. I don't think that I would have had the same experience that I had had I gone down that business. I would have been in a very different world. I probably would have ended up meeting more on the trading desk or something like that, which is, again, a great experience if that's where you'd like to go, but that was not the path that I wanted to necessarily pursue. I think I wanted something a little more rounded, and I, I like touching a lot of points. I think I'd get too bored focused on just that part. I, I agree completely with Christine. Um, once upon a time, I was an engineering major, and I got out of that. Um, not that I didn't <laughs> like it. But sociology, to me, seemed like it could, it, it could provide such a great skill set. When I was here, I lived with two engineers, a finance major, and an accounting major. And they used to make fun of me all the time about norms and values and mores and, and things like that. But I can write circles around them. And the communication skills, Vince touched on the importance of communication skills. That is one of the greatest elements of human capital that you can carry with you when you go out into the workforce. Human capital, well, what I mean by that is your value in the workplace. If you can communicate well, you have made yourself very valuable. And that's what sociology gives you. And I can tell you kind of an interesting story that um, about the value of, of how some companies really do value the written skill set. Uh, my husband just started working for Amazon in September. And his first meeting he ever went to, and I don't know if you've ever read anything about Jeff Bezos, the way that he runs his company is they write these things called six pagers. So at the management level, when they come in for a new product, they have a six page written document. They walk in the room and there's a 15 minute reading period. And they have to sit there, every single one of them sit there and read it, read through it, and then discuss it. And everything, the written word is so valid, they actually have to write writing tests before they come in. And these are guys, I mean, my husband's a computer engineer, kind of you know, background, running teams. And, but they all have to know how to write. The written skill set is so important. So if you don't have those backgrounds too, it's gonna, that's an important skill to have. Yeah, this notion that you go to college, in a year or two you figure out exactly what you want to do with your life, and then you get trained to do that with your major, is hilarious. <laughs> and has happened exactly zero times in the 30 plus years I've been professing. Uh, the truth is, whatever your major, you accumulate skills. Uh, so that's what you're selling. Nobody's going to say, uh, you, know, you majored in sociology, write a treatise on Durkheim. But there are, there are things you get, and as Vince pointed out, from doing so that are cash on the barrel and skills. Vince, I think you might have uh, known what I meant when I said that you're the best speaker, which I say about everybody, and also. One of the funniest, um, getting at that story. Your favorite story. Yeah, the famous story. Now, I, know, I don't know yeah, how many people how many people are underneath you? 50? Okay, and sometimes termination is, is required. Sometimes termination is required. Would you tell them about the termination room? The termination room is a, a, a room behind locked door in HR. 
where when someone has not performed up to the expectation and not delivered value back to the company, um, they need to be let go. So when you go into the room, it is you, the manager, and someone from HR, and the individual. And uh, it's your favorite part, right, Bernie? Yeah. Everything except the tissue box and the chairs are bolted down. <laughs> I love it. So if something should happen, the worst you'll do is get a paper cut from the tissue box. <laughs> they can't pick up the chair and hit it. Is that the most stressful part of your job, having to do that? You know, it doesn't happen. Believe it or not, like, as daunting as it sounds, that doesn't happen a lot. Um, people really are passionate and dedicated and work hard. Most of the time when things like that occur, it's because they're just in a place that's not a good fit for them. And, you know, I think the most interesting thing that I've learned is that, um, and this is probably the more stressful part of, of the job. The stressful part of the job is making sure that I'm being honest with people because that's ultimately what they want. You know, there's people who you're honest with along the way who actually understand the fact that failure can be a success. It's just sometimes you don't see it yourself. So helping them along and saying like, hey, listen, you're not, you're not in the right job, you're not in the right place, there's, there's probably somewhere else that's better for you. Um, when they don't see that and understand that, that creates a lot of stress because then you're getting resistance around the fact that they're never going to be able to help themselves in the longer run. But when you can talk to them and have them understand that, you know, I've seen people who have left the company on the way out and said, hey, can I just shake your hand and say thank you for opening my eyes to the fact that this isn't the world that I belong in. And then they go back to school, go to other places, and they're unbelievably successful. So, you know, Running the business is, a lot of people think running the business and running a big, big business is very, very stressful. It's, it's got its stresses, but you know what those stresses are, and you can manage them because you, you deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think sometimes more of the stress is around when you're not reaching people the way you want to reach them and help them. And the most stress, I think, comes from actually outside of work, between balancing family, and balancing work, and balancing school. I want to take back something that I said to you when you asked the question about go to school now or wait. Uh, actually, I had an experience like Joe where I went right into uh, graduate school for the sake of continuing, but I forgot to tell you the big bust, and that was I was in the wrong program. So I spent two years in an MBA program and actually discovered that I had absolutely no interest in it. But accidentally, yeah. given the opportunity, because I bullshitted the dean, into taking a social course for the first time in my life and realized two years in the graduate school, that's really where I belong. So I want to sort of retreat on that. I'm glad I didn't leave the academic world because we have all this fun. So going on. Any other questions? Dan, you're usually good for any for Why do you always call me after? I don't know, because you're funny and you're smart. Come on, Dan, bring it. Um, give me like, can't just do this. Give me like two minutes, I'll think of a very good question. Hey, Dan, do you have an IRA? Uh, Dan, do you know what an IRA is? Anybody tell me what an IRA is? It's a retirement account. Yes, it's an individual retirement account. No, I don't. All right. Does anybody in here have an IRA? I didn't expect any of you to. This is a public service <laughs> message, okay? <laughs> and I think all three of us will agree, when you get a job, set aside 10% of your money yes. and put it in an IRA or every year. Or 401k. Or 401k okay. or whatever. And you're going to think, well, yeah, it's easy for them to say, but I just got this job for $35,000 a year and I don't have the money to... Yeah. Trust me, I wish somebody would have told me this when I was your age. I didn't figure it out to my early 30s. When you retire one day, the amount of money you have in your retirement is largely determined by how early you start. If you Google an IRA calculator and put in 4000 a year and what your age is, it's going to show you how much you're going to retire with. The earlier you do this, the better. That's all. I'm sorry. Excellent. Excellent point. And let me give you let me give you a living example of what happens if you don't do that. When I first came to Villanova, I was 26 years of age. I didn't even want to hear the word retirement. To me, that was something that happened to people on another planet. The chairman at the time said, Bernie, you have to start taking X amount of dollars out of your monthly paycheck. I said, Dr. Hughes, I'm fine. You know, like I was invincible. I was never going to. So I didn't even start kicking in for 15 years. 
What does that matter now? Well, it's about half the size it would have been had I listened to the chairman in the first place. So, boy, I learned the hard way about, about the point that you missed. I don't want to put any pressure here. No, I'll ask you a question. I, I'm Go sorry. ahead. I just, all right. Um, a damn question. Why with that? <laughs> so, uh, how would you how would you value and how is how has this value changed over time? Like, our age coming out of college, how would you value like taking a job versus like being in a certain location, and how has that changed over time now that you all have developed families? I'm sure you like stability now and knowing that you can be in a certain location. But when you were coming right out of college, would you like I'll go anywhere? And how did you value that versus taking a job? Yeah, I would definitely use this time to travel and to see things and to do things and go to a different place if that's what the opportunity is at this point in your life because you are going to hit a point where you do want a little more stability and less travel and sometimes you don't even you know have that option you still have sometimes have to travel as well but go for it I mean there's so many exciting places to go and to see it's much more difficult um, to try and, and change locations once you've already been established and have kids at school and things like that we were actually faced with looking to move to Seattle to Amazon last June, and that was such a daunting thought because I have a career. You know, he has a career. We have kids in school. We have family. So use that time. I loved it. I traveled a lot the first two years out of college with my job, and it was the greatest time. Everybody's young. You have no ties. You can just do it. Especially, I mean, if you get something even international, get a chance to see some of the world, just do it. Um, there's going to be a time in life where you're going to want to be a little more, you know, I mentioned my, my struggle this year in finding an internship. Well, it's not because I'm a zero. It's that I have limited myself effectively to the Baltimore area, not even DC, because it's, it's a little too far for me to travel. I'm limiting myself to Baltimore because I don't want to uproot my family again. It's the three of us, I'm sure, have been faced with the same sort of things. You have the flexibility right now that if somebody out in San Francisco offers you a job and you're willing to travel, you can do it. You're not taking the three cats, the dog, your two kids, and your wife with you. So I would, I agree with Christine, take advantage of that. Yeah, and enjoy it. That, those are experiences that, you know, life is short. You're going to find in the years go faster and faster the more the longer you're out of college. So, you know, use that time to really explore things and get a chance to, to know different locations. Thank you. Well, I started off mentioning the uh, Jim Croce's and the Carolyn Breland's and the Netta Lynch's of the sociology <coughs> department, but they never ran. And I think that you people are every bit of the same ilk. And I can't tell you, not just the typical. Yes, about how appreciative I am that you took time out of your day. You know I feel that way. You guys are really great. You really were. And on this day, 25th anniversary, I'm sorry, did we get that in? Uh, you really you really helped it rock. All of them. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you can pan in slowly on me now. <laughs> the wedding wall. Thanks, Judith. Thanks, Brian.